Hi guys, how are you? I'm back today with a biology video and I'm going to be talking all things to do with vaccines, herd immunity, how white blood cells work and then a tricky bit on monoclonal antibodies and hopefully at the end of this video you'll be nice and clear on all of these topics. So let's dive straight in. Now remember when we're talking about the immune system, we're talking about remember what happens when you have bacteria and they enter your bodies and they make you ill and obviously you get sick but for most people you don't stay sick for like years and years and years so we're talking about how our body actually fights against those bacteria and that is your immune system and it's specifically your white blood cells and they have some fancy names so for example if a cold virus enters your body what happens is white blood cells called lymphocytes come along and they recognize specific molecules on those cold viruses and we call those molecules antigens. So a very specific lymphocyte will come along and it will release antibodies which will go and attack that cold virus and it will help destroy it and that's how our immune system actually works. Now the way vaccinations work, remember that's what happens if you're going somewhere tropical on holiday or as a kid you'll have probably had a lot of vaccinations maybe against HPV meningitis, that sort of thing. And the way vaccination works is it kind of speeds up your immune system. You have an injection and what they're injecting is a weakened or dead form of the pathogen. Now remember the pathogen is the disease causing organism. So in this case, it's the flu virus. It could be the um, polio virus, it can be many different types of pathogen. But what a vaccination is, is it's a dead form, dead or weakened form of that pathogen. Why does it need to be dead or Weakened, well obviously you don't want it to enter your body and make you ill because that will make that vaccination completely pointless. So they inject it into your body, very specific lymphocytes will come along, they'll recognise the antigen on that pathogen and they'll start releasing antibodies. And some of those lymphocytes then turn into memory cells and that's a really clever cool thing because a memory cell literally memorises that particular pathogen, so whether it's the flu virus or the polio virus. So that if you happen to come in contact at some other point in your life, with that polio, with that flu virus, your body already has memory cells which are waiting and the moment that that polio enters your body you've got massive numbers of memory cells that will start booting out lots and lots of antibodies. And those antibodies will go and attack and actually stop you getting ill in the first place. So vaccinations are really, really important. There was a travesty about, I think it was in the 1960s when this stupid doctor released a document saying that um, I can't remember if it was like whooping cough or something, the vaccination was bad for children. So loads of parents didn't actually get their kids vaccinated against whooping cough and actually loads of children died. So that was really, really bad for that doctor because he should have done his research properly. Um, and yeah, really not, not so good. But yeah, so vaccinations are essential. Now, herd immunity is just a term describing a, when a large number of people get vaccinated against something because something like measles, virus will need a large number of people to infect so it will infect a person who will then go and infect another person that will go and infect another person and that's how the measles virus is spread now obviously if you go and vaccinate loads of people against the measles virus there are going to not be enough people for the measles virus to spread properly between and that's how you actually get herd immunity against something like measles it basically means when a large number of people are vaccinated against a specific disease now the types of vaccinations you might have heard of are things like MMR, which is measles, mumps and rubella, and they may ask you that. And I've already mentioned you may be vaccinated against something like polio. If you've been on holiday, it might be tetanus or cholera, typhoid, all pretty nasty diseases that need vaccinating against. Now we're going to talk about the different types of drug. Now remember a drug is just a chemical which has an effect on the body, so it may be a good drug or a bad drug. So things like coffee contain caffeine, which is a drug because it stimulates you, it increases your heart rate. Then you've heard of things like heroin and cocaine, they're bad drugs, they have bad effects on your body. But a drug in its simplest term is a chemical which has an effect on the body. Now if you get ill, you may take things like aspirin, paracetamol, Nurofen, ibuprofen, and what these are, these are tablets which reduce the symptoms of whatever it is you're suffering from. So they don't actually go to kill the pathogen that you're suffering from. What they do is they alleviate the symptoms, which means they may reduce the headache you're suffering from, they may get rid of some of those snuffly noses, help clear your sinuses, that sort of thing, but they're not actually killing any of the pathogens. If you want to kill a pathogen like a bacteria, you're going to have to use an antibiotic. And antibiotics only work on bacteria. They do not work on viruses, which is why if you go to the doctor and you've got a cold and you're like, 
oh please 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 can I have antibiotics and they're like no it's because the cold is caused by a virus so they won't be handing antibiotics out but the antibiotics are clever they go and work against bacterial cells destroying them without damaging our own cells and that is essential so I've already described one problem with antibiotics, which is that they're only effective against bacteria. The second problem is that increasingly we're seeing antibiotic resistance. And that's what happens when we don't complete the course of antibiotics that we're taking, if we over-prescribe them, because you find that you'll get some strains of bacteria which are actually resistant to the antibiotic. And then before you know it, all the new bacteria that are being made are resistant. So back in the day when a certain antibiotic would work, you're finding later that it doesn't work and obviously that's going to cause massive issues if we don't have antibiotics that work. Let's talk about how we actually go about developing drugs then to treat ourselves. So in terms of what we're after from a drug, obviously you want it to be effective because what's the point of taking a drug if it doesn't actually work? You want it to be safe so you don't want to have it causing any adverse effects on your health because that wouldn't be great. You want it to be stable and what that means is that it needs to be easily stored. You don't want a drug that can only be taken within like a week and then goes off in the cupboard and starts causing like problems. You want it to be nice and stable. And lastly, the least obvious one, it needs to be successfully taken into your body, so easy to deliver, whether that's drinking it or having it injected, and it needs to be able to be removed from your body too. I don't know if you know this, but lots of drugs come from plants. Um, and lots of these plants are found in the rainforest and obviously you can't get some chemical from a plant and then just give it straight to someone because you don't know the effects it will have and it may kill them. So there are lots of stages involved in the development of a drug. The first stage is preclinical trials and that's when they test a chemical or a drug out on tissues or cells or other animals and that's where animal testing comes in and that's why lots of people have lots of problems with animal testing and I understand that. Once they've tested out on the animals, on other cells, they will then start testing them out on human volunteers and we call that clinical trials and they'll start by giving human volunteers very very small amounts so that if there are going to be bad effects hopefully they're not going to be too dangerous and then they'll increase that dose the amount that they give the person bit by bit um, until they're happy that it's the right amount when you're talking about actually doing trialing there's something called a double blind trial and that's when neither the doctor nor the patient know whether they're being given the drug or not. Um, and that's essential because a lot of times if a patient is given a drug and told that it's really going to work, they actually kind of get themselves better through their own mental state of mind. They'll be like, wow, I've been told this drug will work, um, so I'm going to get better because of it. And um, that's obviously giving you a false positive result because it's not necessarily the drug doing that. So a double blind trial is when neither the patient or the doctor actually giving the drug know whether the patient's had the drug. Because the other thing they could be given is a placebo, and a placebo is just a tablet that's like made out of sugar that has no drugs in it. So some patients will be given a placebo, some will be given the drug, and then you'll look at the results to try and work out how effective that drug is. Now we're getting onto the tricky topic of monoclonal antibodies. So what we're talking about here is a new development, it's a new technology. And we need to first of all understand what the word hybridoma means. And all that means is it's a new cell type formed by combining mouse cells, human cells, and cancer cells in order to form a new type of cell. So I've already told you that lymphocytes will produce antibodies which will go ahead and destroy pathogens. But the problem with lymphocytes is they don't actually divide and grow. So in an ideal world, you'd get a load of someone's lymphocytes, cause them to divide to make loads of antibodies, and then go around treating people using those antibodies. But I've just said that lymphocytes don't divide. So what we need ideally is a type of cell which divides rapidly. And in this case, we know that cancer cells divide very rapidly because they go ahead, they form tumours. That's a really terrible thing about cancer cells is these tumours that grow and obstruct parts of our organs. So if they're in our brain or our heart, that's where all the issues arise from with cancer. So if you can think you could get a lymphocyte that's producing all those awesome antibodies that will go and kill stuff, but then you've got the cancer cell which has the ability to copy itself and divide lots. Imagine if you combine them, then you'd have the perfect situation where you're going to generate lots of antibodies that will go ahead and kill stuff, but won't be cancerous and therefore won't cause any problems. And that's really what this monoclonal antibody stuff is all about. Now, what does the term monoclonal antibody mean? Well, it's just a protein which is made to target specific cells. So the crucial thing here is they're very specific. Now, they found that mice lymphocytes, so that little mouse, they found that lymphocytes inside the mice are amazing at producing these monoclonal antibodies. 
So they combined it with the cancer cell in order to form this hybridoma, which I've already mentioned, and then that could go ahead producing all the antibodies needed to destroy dangerous cells. I mean, the obvious problem with this is that they come from mice, and obviously our bodies are going to recognise mice cells as being foreign, um, and then our immune system will try and attack those mice cells. So what they then did was they combined it with human cells in order to prevent the rejection issue, and that's why the hybridoma is a combination of mouse, human, and cancer cells. So how can monoclonal antibodies be used? Well, firstly, pregnancy testing, because there's a hormone called HCG, which pregnant women make. Now, what happens is the monoclonal antibody can actually bind to that hormone, and then it gets expressed in urine, which can then be detected. So it's actually impossible to get a false positive result. You will not get a false positive result. You will definitely be pregnant if you get a positive result, so don't... Yeah, I think that's quite an essential life point right there. The second thing that you can use monoclonal antibodies is for detecting disease because it can actually bind to disease cells and that's used to detect prostate cancer in men, for example. And lastly, you can use monoclonal antibodies to detect levels of, of hormones. So an example of this is, you know how people donate blood because blood donations are really important, but obviously you don't want someone with the disease AIDS or HIV donating blood because that could go and infect the poor people that the blood's being given to. So monoclonal antibodies can actually be used to screen that blood and see if there's any HIV in there. Really, really good stuff. Now, how can monoclonal antibodies be used to treat cancer? Because really that's what we're after. That's the really amazing role that they perform. So first of all, they can help carry toxic drugs to the cancer cells and therefore those toxic drugs can go to work on the cancer cells without affecting our normal cells. Secondly, the monoclonal antibodies can help trigger our immune system to actually go and attack those cancer cells, whereas before it might not have been doing that. And thirdly, those monoclonal antibodies can block the receptors on cancer cells, and those receptors are needed to help that cancer cell divide to form a tumour. So if it blocks the receptors, they can't divide anymore, which is obviously essential to prevent tumour growth. Now we need to look at the advantages of monoclonal antibodies. The first thing is that they have no effect on healthy cells, and that's crucial because a lot of cancer treatments such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy do go and damage a lot of healthy human cells which is obviously not what we're wanting. The second thing is that the monoclonal antibodies can be used to treat a wide range of conditions. However, sadly there are disadvantages. That is, some side effects can arise from using monoclonal antibodies and actually the technology involved has been tricky to develop, much trickier than they first imagined when they first started developing this. Right, I'm going to try and find you some questions now. I hope you found this video helpful. It's a pretty tricky topic and it does require you to understand quite a few key words such as lymphocyte, pathogen, um, monoclonal antibody, etc. So do try and learn those definitions. Give it a like if you enjoyed it and don't forget to sub guys. See you soon. Bye. I'm going to show you how to answer this monoclonal antibody question. Question 11. Monoclonal antibodies are used to measure the levels of hormones in the blood. Pregnant women produce the hormone HCG. HCG is excreted in urine. Figure 8 shows four pregnancy test strips, and we've got a key on the right-hand side, which I'm not going to deal with quite at the moment. Which test strip shows a negative test result? Tick one box. So we're looking for negative test result. To avoid getting confused with the key, just zone in on the negative test result bit, which says a line appears only in the control window, and then look, a lot, look across at those four strips and have a look for the one which shows a line only in the control window. And if I look at A, yeah, there's a line in the control window and there's nothing in the result window. And then if you look across, you can see, yeah, that A is definitely the one that's applicable here. So that's why A is the answer. Don't panic. Make sure when you're answering these questions, you read it really slowly and don't get confused. Part two, monoclonal antibodies are used for pregnancy testing. Give one of the use of monoclonal antibodies. I've already mentioned this in my video, so it's used to treat cancer, or you could say it's used to locate specific other hormones. Three, figure nine shows the parts of a pregnancy strip. So, number one, urine is applied here. Two, there's a reaction zone where there are mobile antibodies specific to HCG here. These antibodies can move and have blue dye attached to them. So obviously these mobile um, antibodies, they're the monoclonal antibodies and they're going to bind to any HCG hormone which is in the pregnant woman's urine and they'll be able to move because they're mobile. Result window three, immobilized antibodies specific to HCG here. So that tells us that if the woman is pregnant and that she does have HCG in her urine, 
that they're going to bind to those monoclonal antibodies and they'll end up showing themselves in the result window as a blue line. Control window number four, immobilized antibodies specific to the mobile antibodies from the reaction zone. So that's just saying that there are other antibodies there which will just move and just show that the pregnancy test is actually working correctly. The pregnancy test strip will show a positive test result when a woman is pregnant. Explain how the pregnancy test strip works to show a positive result. Six mark. AKA, this is so horrible. Like, you're not really even testing anything about monoclonal antibodies. You're testing more about how well people can understand figure nine. But let's start with the most obvious thing, first of all, which is that obviously urine, which is applied at the bottom, will have to pass along the whole test strip in order for the pregnancy test to work. So just make a general comment about that. Then you're going to make a comment which is specific to monoclonal antibodies and just state the fact that the HCG hormone in the urine will bind to the mobile HCG antibody. And then because it doesn't just stay in the reaction zone, you're going to point out that it's then going to move upwards and bind to the result window. Then you're going to talk about the fact that there are other antibodies which are not specific to HCG and they'll end up at the control zone and then just point out how you will show that it's a positive test result because that's what's actually being asked in the question. And you're going to talk about the fact that you'll see a line in both the control window and the result window. As you can see, I've made six separate points, so don't just keep repeating yourself. You must be very specific. Question four. The MMR vaccine is used to protect against measles. Apart from measles, which two other diseases does the MMR vaccine protect against? So what does the other M and the R stand for? That's mumps and rubella. Read the information. Measles is a dangerous disease caused by a virus. Normally, MMR vaccinations are given at one years old and again at four years old. Each vaccination is 90% effective in protecting against measles. In April 2013, there were 630 cases of measles in children aged four and over in a small area of the UK. Of these cases, 504 had not been vaccinated against MMR at all and only few had been given a second vaccination. See, there are numbers backing up the fact that vaccination is mega important. Calculate the percentage of children who caught measles in April 2013 who had not been vaccinated against MMR. So it's a simple calculation. You want to do 504 divided by the total number of children, which was 630, and then because it's a percentage, times by 100, and you'll get an answer, which is 80%. Suggest so one advantage to the population as a whole of children having the second MMR vaccination. That's due to... Um, children, basically lots and lots of children getting vaccinated and I already mentioned the term for this which is herd immunity. What does a vaccine contain? Remember it contains a dead or an active form of the pathogen. Explain how vaccination prevents infection, that's three marks so you want to make three separate points. So you want to say that that vaccination with the dead pathogen stimulates the white blood cells, the lymphocytes to produce antibodies and then remember that some of those white blood cells turn into memory cells so that if the pathogen re-enters, those antibodies are produced far more quickly and can kill the pathogen before it takes a grip. Antibiotics can only be used to treat some infections. Explain why antibiotics cannot be used to treat measles. Two marks. First mark is for saying that antibiotics, antibiotics are only suitable against bacteria. Second mark, point out that measles is a virus and that antibiotics do not work against viruses. Why do antibiotics become less useful at treating an infection if the antibiotic is overused? And I said that it's due to the fact that antibiotic resistance occurs and that the pathogen or the bacteria can no longer be killed by the antibiotic. Right, hope you found that helpful, guys. Um, see you soon. Bye.